So lab test two is going to be on when, uh, excuse me, on Thursday. And make sure when you come for lab test two, you bring a calculator. You're going to need a calculator. And of course, a really great pencil. So I just hand wrote what you have already pretty much on your uh, review sheet. So number one is for exercise five, identify reactants and products when written in a chemical reaction. And so, guys, what I want to do is uh, use this chemical reaction. So if you want to write it into your notes, that would be super. This was the chemical reaction that we used when we did lab on enzymes. Our laboratory activities on enzymes used this chemical reaction. And so that would be a significant chemical reaction to me. So you may recognize H2O2. Does anybody know what chemical that is, H2O2? That's very good, Haley. It's hydrogen peroxide. That one's hydrogen peroxide. And then you'll notice hydrogen peroxide breaks apart into water and oxygen. And it does so very quickly in the presence of the enzyme catalase. And again, that was the enzyme that we used. Okay, so we're supposed to be able to identify the reactants and identify the products in a chemical reaction. And so in this chemical reaction, what are the reactants? H2O2, that's good. So that's the reactant. And I'm just going to put an R, and I'm using that light pink color up there. I just put an R above the reactant. And then what are the products? Water and oxygen, that's good. So both water and oxygen are the products. So I put a letter P above it. And then what about catalase? What role does catalase play? What is it? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. What is catalase? It's not a reactant and it's not a product. So what would it be? You have to speak louder, I'm sorry. Enzyme. Who told me that? Oh, good, Patricia. Enzyme. How did Patricia know it was an enzyme? Very good, Miguel. It ends with ACE. It's also written above the arrow indicating it's not a reactant, it's not a product, but it definitely speeds the reaction. That's what enzymes do. They speed up reactions. Okay, question two is define enzyme, <laughs> substrate, active site, and enzyme substrate complex. So for this one, I found something similar. It's not exactly the same, but similar to what you have on page 57. So I'd put page 57 as a reference for this. And so I think you guys can tell what I did here is I wanted you to pretend you had this picture, but that the words were gone. You see how I scratched out the words? And so using this picture, could you label the things that are listed on number two? So let's start with the enzyme. How would you know which one is the enzyme? Remember, the words would not be there. Because of the active site, Patricia notices that this enzyme has these depressions here that seem complementary to the other. Okay, another way to know, because I think there's only two choices here. The enzyme is either this one or the enzyme is either this one. There's really only two choices, correct? So if you'll notice, the enzyme does not change through the whole picture. Everybody look at the enzyme. Does it change? No. But this other one does. The other one does. So besides the active site, because Patricia's right, you can spot an enzyme because of its active site. But besides that, also notice the enzyme does not change. Okay, so that's the enzyme. All right, now we're looking for the substrate. How would you know which one's the substrate? Well, what is a substrate? Tell me again. It's the reactant. Substrate is the reactant. That's correct. And so it'll be what you start with. So here's the substrate right here because that's what I'm going to start with. Okay, everybody can spot the active site, correct? Active site would be right here on the enzyme. Active sites are on enzymes. 
Enzyme substrate complex. Does it get any easier than this? I don't think so. There it is right there. And then, of course, what would this be out here that I'm drawing a circle on? What would that be? Products. So substrates change into products. Ready? Okay, on the idea that I'm going to give you a picture like page 57, but I'm going to take all the words off, and you have to label it yourself. All right, I have what is the effect of an enzyme on the energy of activation of a chemical reaction? It's the second part of number two. Now, guys, can you see I drew a graph? Everybody's okay on my graph? And um, let me just go over my graph. Um, in case you can't tell, my x-axis is time. And it's in seconds. Time's going by in seconds. And my y-axis is energy. Energy. Capital E is energy. And low energy is at the bottom and higher energy is at the top. All right, I've got two different graphs here. I've got one that's red and one is yellow. Now, it doesn't matter which one I pick, so I'm going to pick the yellow one to dash this in. The amount of energy that has to be put into a chemical reaction for it to go forward is what I just indicated here with this double arrow. And that has a name. We called it the energy of activation, E, little case, lowercase a, energy of activation. So that's what this question is asking us, is what is the effect of an enzyme on the energy of activation? And before we answer that question, can you tell me which of my lines, red or yellow, would have the enzyme? Which one would go faster? <coughs> the one with the yellow. Wouldn't that go faster? So which one has the enzyme? The yellow. Okay, so look at the picture and tell me what would happen to the energy of activation if you use an enzyme. Does it go up? Does it go down? Or does it not change? You need to tell me louder, I'm sorry. The energy of activation increases. Well, let's see. Here's the energy of activation without an enzyme. Here's the energy of activation with the enzyme. So what happens to the energy of activation? It goes down. Here's the energy of activation with no enzyme. See how tall it is? Here it is with an enzyme. See how short it is? So the answer is it goes down goes down. It decreases. It goes down. It takes less energy to get the chemical reaction to go if you have an enzyme. Morning. Okay, that's number two. Number three, what happens when an enzyme is denatured? Better remember that word, denature. Seems familiar, but what is it? Anybody? Nobody. That's right. That's good, Renee. That's Lucas. That's wrong. Is that going to be good for the enzyme? Yes or no? No. I wrote that that causes it to stop working. Okay, what conditions might cause an enzyme to denature? High heat. Very good. High temperature. We're not just talking warm, we're talking hot here. We're talking hot. Okay, anything else? Not cold. pH, you tell me that. Good job, Miguel. pH, extreme pH. Like really acidic or really basic? 
extreme pHs will typically denature an enzyme. You okay on that one? Okay, the function of catalase, page 58. Let's turn to page 58. And on page 58, I see a chemical reaction. You maybe highlighted or boxed it on uh, the day that we did this activity. Generally, what would you say catalase does? It breaks down. Hydrogen peroxide. Okay, that day, how did we judge if catalase made the reaction occur? What did we look for? Bubbles. I'm so glad we're reviewing you. People are or just lost. Okay, so bubbles. What gas was making those bubbles? Oxygen. Good job. Oxygen bubbles. We looked for bubbles. Ready? Okay. Great. Okay, then we did an activity on temperature, page 60, page 60. This is on page 60. So let's turn to page 60 and look at our data. We had a cold temperature of the refrigerator. I think it was what, 3.5 degrees Celsius, 3.7, what was it? 3.5, Andy said 3.5 degrees Celsius. Then we had a warm, I think that one was 40 degrees Celsius. And we had a hot, I believe 90 degrees Celsius. You okay on all three situations? Remember, we were looking for bubbling. <coughs> what effects do the different temperatures have on catalase activity? When it was cold, did catal catalase work well? Okay, so it worked well. So cold was good. No problem, catalase says. I can work at cold. Okay, how about warm? It worked, so still good. Good at the warm temperature. How about hot? No. no. How come? It's very good. It was denatured. Catalase was denatured. So that goes with the why. Why did the hot not work well? Because that might have surprised you that it didn't work well. The hot didn't work well because the heat denatured the enzyme. It stopped working. Okay, number five. Super. Number six is omit because we didn't do it. We didn't do that activity. Number six is omit. Number seven is when we did the same enzyme, but this time we did with pH, page 62, page 62. Number seven goes with page 62. It says, what's the effect of a pH outside of the optimum range of an enzyme? Well, first of all, can you tell from your data on page 62, what was the optimum pH for catalase? When did it bubble the best? Neutral. Neutral. Yes, I think that's test tube two. Is that correct? <laughs> okay, and then the outside of those ranges, I don't think that we did as well. So I drew, drew some test tubes to represent your data tables. Okay, check out my test tube number one and just compare it, I think, to test tube number one in your book. I believe test tube number one had acid in it, HCl. Is that correct? What was the pH? What's the pH of test tube number one? Three? I don't think so. One. Okay, did you get bubbles there? No, no bubbles. Here you go, Chris. Okay, test tube number two. What was the pH of test tube number two? Six. Did you get bubbles? Yes. 
Yes, I'm going to put in some bubbles here. Bubbled nicely. And test tube number three, I believe, had sodium hydroxide in it. Sodium hydroxide. What was the pH? 14. Did you get bubbles? No. no. Okay, how come test tube one didn't bubble? It didn't make oxygen, so why didn't it make oxygen? The pH. Tell me more about the pH. Thank you. The pH, which was very low, denatured the enzyme. So acid will denature most enzymes. And obviously it denatured our enzyme catalase, because the catalase wouldn't work. Okay, with Brian's word, denature. Okay, test tube 2, the catalase was not denatured. How do we know in test tube 2 that the catalase was not denatured? Because it worked. We got bubbles. Okay, test tube 3. I see test tube 3 did not work. Why? The pH. Tell me about this base. What did it do to the catalase? Denatured it. Are you feeling more comfortable with the word denature? Yeah, ten minutes ago we didn't even want to say it. Now we're feeling better about it. Everybody's okay on this one? Okay, great. All right, that brings us to lab six on photosynthesis. We're going to go over to page 67. It's page 67. Again, I'm just writing down these page numbers for reference when you go back and study at your convenience at home. And so we have to know the chemical reaction, and I see it right there on page 67, the overall chemical reaction for photosynthesis. I'm just copying it. Does anybody know what CH2O is an abbreviation for? Carb, very good. In case you didn't know that, that's carbohydrate. Okay, I wrote the equation here. What are the reactants of photosynthesis? Go ahead. That's right, Danellis is right. CO2 and H2O, those are the reactants of photosynthesis. I used R for reactants. And what are the products of photosynthesis? Carbohydrate and oxygen are the products. Now, there is one thing I left off of my drawing. They use the word solar energy, but I'm not writing all that out. I put the word sun. Are you okay with that? Can you do photosynthesis without light? No. That's what puts the photo in photosynthesis, because photo means light. But it's okay on that one. Super. Same question. In what organelle, and I'll give you a hint, it is on page 67. In what organelle does photosynthesis occur? Good. It's, he's correct. Photosynthesis occurs in chloroplasts. And again, that's on page 67. Page 68. We did an uh, activity called paper chromatography. Does this seem a little bit familiar? It's where we mashed a leaf repeatedly over on a, a strip of paper. We put it into a test tube with some solvent, and the solvent moved up the paper, separating the pigments, and we looked at the pigments. Okay, what kind of solvent do you use in paper chromatography? Non. It is ether. Polar. So you're both correct. It was ether, which is a nonpolar solvent. Remember that means it has no charge. No charge. 
And the reason we chose a nonpolar solvent is because, just from my experience, I knew the pigments in a leaf have no charge. So they're not going to dissolve in water. So that's why I didn't use water. I used what would dissolve them, a nonpolar solvent. And Miguel's correct, it was ether. Okay, how does paper chromatography separate molecules? How does it do it? I think you hand wrote a sentence on page 68 to assist us. It separates pigments based on solubility. Very good. Separates pigments. In our case, we did pigments. And again, solubility is how well they dissolve. They don't all dissolve equally well in the ether. Some dissolve very well and will travel very far. Some do not dissolve well at all, thus will not travel very far. So take a look at my drawing. It's not as good as the one in your book, but my drawing is something like letter C, page 68. On the test, Thursday, you have to tell me what each of these pigments are. So let's just practice. Starting at the top of our chromatogram, I remember we found a yellow band, a yellow pigment, the very top. What was the name of that? Carotene. Carotene. That's good, Chris. Carotene. Okay, then we came down and we found another yellow band. What would that be? Xanthophyll. Then we came down, we started seeing green. We saw a big band of a really bright, crisp green. What was that? Chlorophyll A. Oops. And then a little bit of kind of a brownish green right beneath, and that was chlorophyll B. Okay, and then I have this little question down at the bottom. I think I got that off of your review sheet. You get these four choices, carotene, xanthophyll, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and I want to know out of those four, which is the most nonpolar? Carotene. carotene. Everybody agree it's carotene because it went the farthest. Okay, on paper chromatography. Okay, question number three tells us to go over, and as you're going over to page 72, just make a quick mental note of page 70. I like page 70. I know I told you I like it. I like it because it shows how the sun shine from the sun. The light from the sun is actually all the colors of the rainbow. Okay. Page 72. Study the absorption spectrum on page 72. What colors of light does chlorophyll absorb the best? And let's just use chlorophyll A. Which colors of light does chlorophyll A absorb the best? Do it again. Purple and blue. Especially right in the purple. It looks real good in the purple. Anything else? Any other color that you want to mention? Chlorophyll A. Thank you. Red. Nick said, look at red. There's a nice peak in red. Red is good. Everybody see the peak in red? Okay. What colors of light does chlorophyll absorb the least? Green. Well done. Green. Then how did you guys correctly figure that out? What did you look for to know what it was absorbing the best? Peaks or valleys? Peaks. And to know what it was absorbing the least, you look for valleys. Because if you'll check out the y-axis, the y-axis is absorption. So peaks means good absorption. Valleys mean not good absorption. But okay, on how to read the graph. Super. Question number four. Stay on page 72. 
I see chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and the carotenoids on that, all on that same graph. And we all know chlorophyll A is the one that a plant has to have. It's got to have that one. The others we call accessories. You don't have to have an accessory, but they are nice. Accessories are nice. Okay, so the question is, why is it beneficial to have several plant pigments involved in photosynthesis? What benefit do you get? How come plants don't just have chlorophyll A? Any benefit there? Looking at the graph on page 72. Say it again, Sarah. Absorb more light. That's excellent. You can absorb more light. Well done, Sarah. You see how you can absorb over into the blues and, and with the carotenoids on into the greens. And then look, you pick up in the yellows, the oranges and the reds. Really just right there in the greenish yellow, that's really the only place is that you're not absorbing much at all with those plant pigments. Okay, what color of light is the best color of light for photosynthesis? I hear nothing. Nope. It would be white. Why? Why is white light the best? Because it's all the colors. You get blue, you get purple, you get red. Yeah, you get all of that. So the answer is white. Well done. Okay, look out the window. Everybody look out that window. Everybody see my plants out there? See plants? What color of light would be the worst color of light for photosynthesis? Definitely. What do plants do with green? They reflect it. Well done. Okay, question five. True or false? Most plants carry out photosynthesis only during the day. Patricia's correct. True. It's just true. Why? You gotta have sunlight. Yeah. You gotta have sunlight. This is true. This one's true. You gotta have the light to do photosynthesis. True or false? Plants carry out cellular respiration, you know, where they use carbohydrates to make ATP. Plants carry out cellular respiration only at night. True or false? Nope. It's false. Plants carry out cellular respiration all the time, day and night. But you've got to be making ATP. All cells require ATP. So as soon as a cell, it doesn't matter who you are, as soon as a cell stops respiring, what's going to happen to that cell? It's going to die. There's no way plants can wait till nighttime to get the job done. They've got to have ATP all the time. Okay, on this one. Okay, let us all progress over to page 74. I think you may have made some notes on page 74 that would be useful at this time. So one day, the day we were doing photosynthesis, I gave you a beaker and put, you put water in it and you put some phenol red in it. And phenol red is a pH indicator. And then uh, I gave you a straw. You may remember this because of the straw. And you had to blow through the straw, do you remember? Bubbling your breath through the water. Did the water stay pink when you bubbled your breath through there? No, what color did it turn? Yellow, that's good. So here's the water in the beaker and then here's the CO2 that came from your breath. Everybody okay? The CO2 is what you were breathing out. And then if you add that together, which we did on page 74, I'm just getting this off of page 74, you get H2CO3. What is H2CO3? 
carbonic acid. So the reason the phenyl red turns yellow when you added the CO2 is because you made an acid and phenyl red perceives acid. When phenyl red is in the presence of acid, it turns yellow. So the answer is because you made carbonic acid. And don't worry, it's a weak acid, but it's still an acid. You think my artwork? Huh? So here's your beaker. You blew in it. You turned it yellow. You put it in the window. How am I showing in my picture you put it in the window? The sun. And when we came back the next time, the yellow was gone and now it was pink. I remember that. Maybe you wrote it down in your notes on that page. That the beaker from the light went from yellow back to pink. Pink. So I have, why did the solution turn back to red after being placed in the light? Did it release CO2? It used the CO2. So I'm going to write that down. The plant used the CO2. Doing what? Photosynthesis. So we all agreed the pink meant that the CO2 was gone. And we were like, well, where did it go? And everybody agreed the plant took it to do photosynthesis. Okay, on that question. Okay. Now, I don't know if you can tell, that's not a little fingernail right there. It's supposed to be the moon. What am I trying to show you? Dark, darkness. So you may remember we took one beaker and put it in a drawer. Total darkness. And when we left the beaker, it was yellow. We came back two days later, and it was yellow. So I have, why did the solution stay yellow when placed in the, in the dark? Yeah, plant could not do photosynthesis. So that water is still full of CO2. No light, no photosynthesis. Okay, number seven. I have, why is it important to have autotrophs, heterotrophs, and decomposers in an ecosystem? Okay, well, I drew um, an aquarium. Let me tell you about my aquarium. Blue is water. These orange things are supposed to be fish. The green things are plants. And the brown on the bottom would be gravel. You okay on that? And I have it by a window so it can get some sunlight. And then, I don't know if you can tell, I put a cover on it. Put a cover on it. And here's why. If you'll take a look, i got this fish, and this fish is doing cellular respiration. And I don't know if you can tell, this fish is pooping. Can you see the poop? The fish is poop. Well, fish poop. Sorry, people. Fish poop. Okay. And so this, these fish are respiring, and they're producing CO2 and water, and they're also pooping and urinating. Okay, here's this plant, and it's doing photosynthesis, so it's making carbohydrate and oxygen. Now, who will use the oxygen? The fish. Who will use the CO2? The plant. Who will use the carbohydrate the plant made? The fish. Okay, so you can kind of see we have a little cycle going here between the autotrophs and the heterotrophs. Who are the autotrophs? The plants. Who are the heterotrophs? Where are the decomposers? On the ground, on the gravel. Who are these decomposers? What's their name? Like fish or plant. That's not it. What are they called, these decomposers living in the gravel? There's the letter B. Bacteria. Okay, what will the bacteria do? 
They need a food source. What's their food source? Fish. Waste. waste. I was going to say poop, but nice choice, Brian. Good job. The waste products, the, um, the, the urine from the fish, they can use that. The feces from the fish, they can use that. Is that important to have them, these bacteria? Yeah, if you didn't have the bacteria, what's going to happen? The feces would just multiply inside of there, and what happened to the water? It would be bad, okay? The water would foul, would foul. Is everybody okay on that idea? All right, now which would be better, my aquarium as I have it drawn, look at it, or my aquarium as I have it drawn without the lid on it? Without the lid on it, that's right. Without the lid on it, why? You can get more oxygen, or you can just get more gas exchange, more gas exchange. So with the lid off would be better. And if you've ever had an aquarium, you know you don't just completely seal it up. You let it have exchange from the atmosphere. But okay with that idea? Yes? Super. Okay, so that I believe is number seven. Number seven. Are you okay with that one? All right, well, that moves us to cellular respiration, page 77. I have know the, re know the reactants and know the products of aerobic, and that's on page 77, and anaerobic, that's on page 78, cellular respiration. Okay, so I wrote this one, and I think I got it from page 77. Just rewrote the one that's on page 77. Okay, so let's go over all these parts here. Does anybody know what this C6H12O6 is? It is glucose. That's good. And everybody knows O2 is oxygen. Those are the reactants. Then my products are carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. Now, what makes this one aerobic cellular respiration? That's very good. Good job, Sarah. Oxygen. This is the part that makes it aerobic. And since it is aerobic cellular respiration, can you remember how many ATP I can get out of this total? That's very good. Good memory, Sarah. 38. It's 38. Okay, page 78 has the next one. And again, I think I just wrote it as it is in your book. Yeah, okay. I see glucose at the beginning, but notice no oxygen. So what's the word for that where there's no oxygen? Anaerobic. This is anaerobic, yes, no oxygen. And notice that here the glucose is broken down into CO2 gas, alcohol, and you get some ATP. Everybody notice how many ATP you get? How many? Just two. Okay, now both of these, this is question number two, I think. Both of these ordinarily aerobic or anaerobic, ordinarily begin with what molecule? What do they have in common, what they ordinarily begin with? I'm ready? Both the chemical reaction on page 77 and the chemical reaction on page 78 ordinarily begin with what molecule? Thank you. It's the most common fuel molecule that cells use to do cellular respiration. It's glucose. Glucose. Number three, you still get the same two choices, aerobic cellular respiration or anaerobic cellular respiration. In which of those do you think the glucose is completely chopped up and all the energy is harvested from it? Two choices, aerobic cellular respiration or anaerobic cellular respiration. I'm ready? 
it would be aerobic. And here's how I know. Look at the difference in energy that you got out of it. You got 38 molecules of ATP out of aerobic. So you must have broken a lot of bonds chopping up that glucose to get the energy out of it. You didn't chop up glucose much at all on the anaerobic. How can you tell? You only got two lousy ATP out of there. That's hardly broken down at all. Lazy, that's just lazy. Okay, the second part of number three, everybody knows the answer. How many ATP does each reaction yield? You have to know that. Aerobic is 38, anaerobic is 2. You're okay on question number three? Question number four is the fermentation experiment. And everyone, the fermentation experiment I've drawn up on the screen, but this is page 82 as far as looking at your data. Page 82. And let us look at class data, if you don't mind. Look at your class data. Why would I rather look at class data than your data? Which one's more relevant? Class data or your data? Class data, why? There's a better chance for no error. Better chance for no error. It's more uh, statistically significant if you have a bigger sample size. So let's look at your class data. Now, I don't remember your class data, but I'm thinking that glucose produced the most gas. Is that true? And that uh, fructose came in second place, sucrose came in third place, and water came in last place. Is that true? Okay. Everybody take a look at my drawing. What is the gas that we were measuring inside of each of those tubes? So I'll ask you that. What's gas inside the tubes? It is CO2. Thank you. It's CO2. So what this experiment showed us is that the yeast really liked using the glucose the best to do anaerobic cellular respiration because they made the most CO2. Their second choice was fructose. Their third choice was sucrose. And yeast cannot use water to ferment. As water is not an energy source. Water doesn't have carbon-hydrogen bonds that can be used for energy. Water is not organic. Water is not food. How about that? Water is not food. You guys know that. You know you need water, but can you live on water? No. You have to have some food, some organic material. Okay. So I have... Did the gas bubble increase or decrease with each? And we just said that glucose, it increased the most. Fructose was second. Sucrose was third. Why? The yeast, which are cells, use the sugars for anaerobic cellular respiration. They were looking for the excuse me the ATP out of there they want that 2 ATP and of course someone already told me the gas was CO2 okay so that's all question number 4 question number 4 Okay, question number five says be um, familiar with the aerobic cellular respiration experiment. Okay, so let me tell you what that looked like. So we had this ring stand with a clamp, 
And the clamp was holding up a test tube, a big old test tube. The test tube had a stopper in it with a pipette. In here we put a bunch of cotton and some KOH. And then it just depends on which test tube you are responsible for. Let me show you the three test tubes, page 79. Test tube number one was a bunch of germinating peas. That might have been your test tube, I don't remember. Test tube number two was some peas, but they were dry and glass beads. And test tube number three were glass beads. You guys remember this one? Anyway, the end of this, so I'm just going to put a bunch of stuff in here. The end of this pipette had a hole in it, and we wanted to seal up that hole with something. Do you guys remember what we used? Shaving cream. You guys remember this one. So question six was, which direction did you expect the shaving cream in the pipette to move? Inward or outward? In, okay. And we thought that because the peas, whether they were germinating or dry, they're alive. And so the peas used up the oxygen. Thus, that created a vacuum. You guys know what a vacuum is? What's a vacuum? And I'm not talking about the thing at your house, even though the thing at your house is called a vacuum because it does something. What does it do? A vacuum do? Sucks. That's very good. And it sucks inward, right? Sucks in? Isn't that what your vacuum at home does? It sucks inward? You would not use it if it was sucking outward because it would be pushing dirty air all over your house. Is that what you want? No, you want the dirty stuff to go into the vacuum so you can get rid of it. So it sucks inward. Be okay with my idea, um, excuse me, my use of the word vacuum. Great. Everybody can answer this question. Number seven, what gas was being taken up and used by the germinating peas? That's very good. Oxygen. Oxygen. Okay, guys, that moves us onward to mitosis. We've just been talking about mitosis and the stages of mitosis last week. Interphase, everybody, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase is first introduced to us with the cell cycle on page 86. And here I took a picture of it. This one's from your lecture book similar but just a little bit different. The only thing different is this one has G0, that kind of resting part of the cycle, where a cell just does its normal functions and it's not committed to dividing. Now what I want to do is I want to draw chromosomes on this cell cycle. So I want you to get your book to page 86 and we're going to draw on the cell cycle. Actually, in your lab manual, you're going to do a drawing. And what I want to do is draw what a chromosome looks like at each part of the cell cycle. So I'm going to get us started with G1. So a chromosome in G1 is single-sided, and it's really long and spread out. When a chromosome is all long and spread out, we don't call it a chromosome. We call it chromatin. Now, this chromosome here, I'll draw over it again. Here it is. This chromosome is single-sided. Now, it's going to go to S. What happens in S? Well, just look in your book. What happens in S? It replicates. What does that mean? Makes another copy. So look, watch. I'm going to do it. Here's the one side of it. And now there's the other side of it. So here's the one side of it. Here's the other side of it. It's still all spread out. 
but now it's double-sided. It was still called chromatin, but now it's double-sided. Now in G2, it would still look the same, double-sided, but all spread out. Still going to be double-sided, but all spread out. Still looks the same. But then prophase things change. You may remember that in prophase, this thing's going to coil up real tight. So look what it's going to look like now. And that's more like what we're used to seeing, isn't it? The coiled up X, yes? Okay, we're not going to call this chromatin. Now we call it chromosomes. So what's the difference? Chromatin is spread out. Chromosomes are tightly coiled. But notice it's still double-sided. Now, if you're not sure, as I keep going through this, you can look on page 88 and 89 look at what the chromosomes look like there. There's our blue and um, red, page 88 and page 89. So look how I drew my chromosome and look how it is in prophase in the book. Does everybody kind of agree I'm similar? Okay. All right. Prometaphase is not on our test. So I'm scratching that out. Metaphase. How would you draw the chromosome in metaphase? What would it look like? the same. It's double-sided. It's coiled up real tight. Still looks like an X. It's still double-sided. Looks the same. Okay, then what about anaphase? Still draw it the same? No. Single-sided. Still tight. Now it's single-sided. Because what happened? What happened? What happened in anaphase? They pulled apart. The chromatids pulled apart. Okay, now look at telophase. What's it going to look like in telophase? Single or double-sided? Single. Okay, now let's leave telophase and go into G1. What's the difference between the chromosome in telophase and the chromosome in G1? What's the difference? They're both single-sided, right? So what's the difference? One in telophase all coiled up. One in G1 of interphase is spread back out. Everybody okay with that? So we made the whole cycle. We made the whole cycle. Now, in this cycle, I'm going to start two things. I'm going to start S, and I'm going to start anaphase. Everybody figure out why did your teacher start S, and why did your teacher start anaphase? It's where things change. Everybody take a look at In S, you were single-sided. Now you're double-sided. And then in anaphase, you were double-sided, and now you're single-sided. So I start where things change, where things change. Is everybody okay with that? You okay with my drawing? Super. So I put know the form of DNA in each stage, and that's what we were just doing when we did that. Okay, so we just did that. And then you have to know the difference between chromatin and chromosomes. Okay, now guys, I'm just drawing this just for fun. Just drawing for fun. And I want to know, what do you think I'm drawing? Is this chromatin or chromosomes? That's a chromosome. And when does a chromosome exist? When does a chromosome exist? during mitosis, okay? All right now, what did I just draw? Chromatin, 
when does chromatin exist? During S, any other time? All of interphase. The answer is all of interphase. Chromatin exists during interphase. So I'm going to write that down for you. Just what we came up together, came up with together. Chromatin exists during interphase. Chromosomes exist during mitosis. And again, your picture should go with that. I mean, that should explain what you wrote. Close again. Okay, question number two. Man, I drew some nice chromosomes up here. Huh? One's red and one's blue. And I even labeled the parts. You do have to know then parts of a chromosome. These are on page 86. I found this on page 86. Page 86. You do have to know chromatid and centromere. Okay, on that one, parts of a chromosome. I just want to comment one more time. Uh, usually when you see a picture of a chromosome, and page 86 is an actual photo of one chromosome, you're in metaphase. They like taking pictures of chromosomes in metaphase. They, it's like that's their best time to be photographed. Okay, I've got a few vocabulary words to make sure everybody knows. Cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm. What stage of mitosis is usually visually indicated with cytokinesis? If you see cytokinesis, what stage of mitosis are you in? Sorry? Nope. Nope. It's telophase. The very end. You knew it was one of them. It was a clicker question last week. You got it much better if we were doing them a clicker question, but that's not the point right now. All right, what are spindle fibers? Look at page 88 and 89. What are spindle fibers? They're, they're the fibers that do something. What do they do? They pull chromatids apart. They start forming in um, prophase. They do their job in anaphase. You can see them doing their job right there in anaphase. They start forming way back in prophase. They all get into position in metaphase, then they do their job in anaphase, and then they break back apart in telophase. Can everybody see the, the uh, spindle fibers okay in the pictures? Has everybody got a concept of spindle fibers? Spindle fibers are made of protein, in case you're wondering what are they made out of, that's protein. Okay, lastly, centrioles. Find the centrioles in the picture. What do the centrioles look like in the pictures? It's like two little cylinders. Two little cylinders. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there are two, and they are like cylinders. They always hang out together. What kinds of cells have centrioles? Plant or animal? That's good. Okay, we already did chromatid, central mirror, chromatin, and chromosomes. Did parts of a chromosome. So we're good on that. And guys, that's question number two. I'm working on question number two. Question number three, differences between plant and animal mitosis. Well, you already gave me one difference, that animal mitosis has centrioles, and plants do not.
And then there's only one other difference. Anybody know what the other difference is? Very good. Plants have a cell plate. That's right, Sarah. Plants have a cell plate to do their cytokinesis. What do animals use for cytokinesis? Good job, Andy. Cleavage furrow. Oh, there's my excellent pictures of such. Huh? But I wouldn't put that in my notes. I would just indicate page 89. If you've got a nice cleavage fur at the top of page 89 and a nice cell plate at the bottom of page 89. Why is cleavage furrowing suitable for animals but just won't work for plants? Some plants can't do that. Why can't they do that? Their cell wall. And their cell wall is rigid. You guys know rigid means not bendy. It's just so technical. Not bendy. Rigid. Okay, so I verbally told you guys, but this is back before spring break, so I think you forgot, that I'm going to test you on mitosis in three ways. First, by the pop beads. We built pop bead chromosomes made out of the yellow and the red beads. I think some of you took pictures of the stage of mitosis that day with your cell phone. You know, so you can remember what prophase looked like, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. But if you don't have that, then the pictures through the middle of page 88 and 89 are good. That same day, we looked at slides, and we did animal mitosis very similar to that across the top of page 88 and 89. We did plant mitosis, and that's very similar to what you see across the bottom of page 88 and 89. And then lastly, the models. And guys, as you know, the models are over here, just the other side of uh, Sarah and Miguel and Renee, just right over there. And the blue models are animal mitosis and the uh, kind of clearish, clearish models with orange inside of them, that's plant mitosis. So if you haven't looked at those, make sure you look at those on your way out the door today, the models. But okay, on the three ways I'm going to test you on mitosis. Super. Yeah. Okay. All right, meiosis. We on to the back? Okay, what does the word diploid mean? One set or two sets of chromosomes? Two. Where do you get those sets at? From where? Where'd you get your two sets of chromosomes from? Your parents. One set from your mom, one set from your dad. That means you're diploid. Because everybody knows DI. What's DI mean? Two. Two sets. What does haploid mean? One set or two sets of chromosomes? One set. Okay, and then homologous chromosomes. Well, I see H-O-M-O -O at the beginning. What does H-O-M-O -O mean? Homo, the same. So this is two chromosomes. If they're homologous, you're going to have two chromosomes. They're about the same size and about the same shape. And they have the, in, they have the, the same traits. Like they're going to carry hair color or they're going to carry eye color. Are they going to carry whether you can make a specific enzyme to digest fat? Okay, they're going to carry information for the same traits. Now, do they, does it have to be exactly the same information? Yes or no? Do homologous chromosomes have to carry exactly the same information? Like, if you're carrying information for a gene to code for black hair, does your homologous partner have to say black hair? No. 
You could say brown hair. You could say blue. No, not blue. Not in humans. That's not what, that wouldn't be normal. <laughs> Let me show you a picture of a homologous pair real fast. There's a homologous pair of chromosomes. So I'm saying if you have black hair right here, do you have to have black hair, hair right there? No. But you're going to have something about hair color, correct? Okay. We still count homologous chromosomes. So there are going to be two of them. They're going to be about the same size and shape. All right, your pictures of meiosis are on page 96 and 97, and I want to take a look at it real fast because I want to remind you meiosis is division, and it is not a cloning division. Mitosis is a cloning division where you're going to make identical copies. Not so in meiosis. You're not trying to make identical copies. What's the goal of meiosis? What are you trying to make? Trying to make regular body cells? You're trying to make something more special than that. What are you trying to make? Sperm and eggs. You're trying to make sperm and eggs, right? Meiosis makes sperm, but only in men. And meiosis makes eggs, but only in women. I feel like I'm telling you this for the first time. The birds and the bees. You guys have heard of this before. Super. Okay, now, everybody, page 96 and 97. We're going to start meiosis with a diploid cell. Everybody look at prophase 1. How do I know that cell's diploid? Tell me. Got two sets of chromosomes. Everybody see the 2N in the box? 2N means diploid. 2N means diploid. You're starting with a diploid cell. Look at the end, the very end, bottom corner, page 97. You end up with four cells. Are those cells haploid or diploid? The four you end up with. They're haploid. How do you know? It just says N. It's good. So I said it just says N. Okay, so here's my question. Listen to the question carefully. It's not on your review sheet. During what stage of meiosis does the diploid cell become haploid? Interkinesis. Okay, interkinesis. What if interkinesis is not a choice? It's telophase one. Take a look at telophase one. I can just count the chromosomes in there. These cells started out with four chromosomes, and in telophase one, now the cells only have two. You see the chromosome numbers already cut in half right there. So let me ask you the question again. During what stage of meiosis does the diploid cell become haploid? Telophase one. Make sure you put the one on there. Telophase one. You okay with that question? Okay, try this question. During meiosis division one, what separates? Homologous pairs. Yes, very good. Homologous pairs. Try this question. During meiosis division two, what separates? Sister chromatids. There you go. You found it. You maybe even underline these things on another day. Is that true? Did anybody highlight or underline these things before? Maybe we should now. It's always an anaphase. Have you noticed? The separation is always an anaphase. In anaphase one, homologous chromosomes separate. And in anaphase two, sister chromatids separate. I see the word separate in anaphase. You see it? Kind of goes together. Okay, be familiar with all the pictures of gametogenesis. What did I mean by that? Oh, okay. 
page 101. So making sex cells in the testes is happening at the top of the page, and making sex cells in the ovaries is at the bottom of the page. And look how that sperm escaped from the top of the page and made it to the bottom of the page. Did you see that? Huh? Those tricky sperm. And he fertilized an egg. What do you call a fertilized egg? It starts with a Z. A zygote. That's good. So for number two, I mean page 101. Okay, number three. The ovary, page 102. So the first thing I want to do is ask you to tell me the name this organ. And it's called an ovary. So the question is name this organ. You're going to pick ovary. And then I'll put the pointer on that big cell in the middle. Do I see that big cell? And that's called the oocyte. That's literally egg cell. OO means egg and site means cell. There's the egg cell. Now try this question. And if you need to, reflect back to page 101, the picture of OO genesis at the bottom of page 101. Per original diploid cell in this organ, how many functional sex cells can you get? One. That's right, you only get one. And the other three are called polar bodies. What do they do? They die. You did remember. Excellent. But okay, on the ovary. Okay, the oocyte is the cell that's living in the ovary. And you see how it's living in this big swollen reddish colored area with a white space? Y'all see how the egg's living in this big circular thing? That's the follicle. Just side note, ladies, all those red cells, all those small, tiny red cells, that's what makes your estrogen, all those extra little cells. The egg doesn't do that. The egg is just busy being the egg. Your estrogen's being made by all those little red cells in there. Okay, page 103 for the testis. And again, you have to tell me the name of the organ, and you'll say testis. Now, remember testes are coiled tubes. And if you slice a coiled tube, you're going to see donut-shaped structures. The donut-shaped structures are called seminiferous tubules. I think that's labeled for you there, seminiferous tubules, those big donut-shaped structures. What's the function of a seminiferous tubule? Make sperm. Very good. Seminiferous tubules make sperm. That's correct. Okay, now you got to look. There are some little patches of cells between the donuts. Interstitial cells. And they do something for the men in the room also. Besides making sperm, they make testosterone. The interstitial cells make testosterone. Very good. And again, Guys, I, I understand that this is a lot of information, but I think you can understand why a biology teacher would want you to know about your own sex organs, okay? Because you people are having sex or will be having sex, and you're going to have kids, and you're going to make hormones. Everybody in this room right now is making hormones, okay? And so I'm just trying to, like, make it real for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're okay on the testis? Okay, try this question. Pretend the test is slide is on your test. Everybody just pretend that. And you walk up and it says, name this organ, and you write testis. Or you pick testis. Everybody's okay? Here's the next question. For original diploid cell that starts meiosis, how many functional sex cells can you make? Four. And again, if you want to reference back to page 101, you can see per original diploid cell you start with at the top of the page, you end up with four sperm. Are you okay on those questions?
Okay, on number five, be familiar with what we did with the bead simulation. So I would just study, if you will, I would just study page 96 and 97. Just go back and review page 96 and 97. I remember telling you guys last week I want to put a slide on the test that's got cells due in meiosis. And you have to tell me if they're in the first division or the second division. And everybody was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. You're like, yeah, I can do that. And so they're going to look like the cells that are actual photos. Look at the cells that are the actual photographs on page 97. See those cells? So how do you know if you're in the first division or if you're in the second division? Second division has two cells. It's very good. Okay, here's what you're not going to get. You're not going to get something that looks like intrakinesis. But take a look at that one. That one's too hard. You're not going to get that. But prophase looked good. Prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1. Telophase 1 looks good because I'm starting to see that uh, cell plate forming, but it's not formed yet. I like that one. And then meiosis division two is just too easy. So easy. Everybody's okay with that? Super. Okay, what is synapsis? Okay, look at prophase one. I'm on page 96, prophase one. Find the word synapsis. What does that mean? What's going on there? They may cross over. Let's do that next. But what are the homologous chromosomes doing? They're wrapped around each other. That's good. Okay, then Andy said crossing over. So what is crossing over? That's excellent. Switch. You switch little pieces of DNA with each other. Okay, so you can tell when a chromosome's done crossing over. How can you tell? How can you tell by looking a chromosome's done crossing over? Look at the pictures. How can you tell? Yeah, so the red chromosome will have a little tip of blue. The blue chromosome will have a little pit, tip of red. Everybody's okay with that? Okay, and then lastly, why do cells do that in meiosis? What are they trying to do here? Mm -hmm. Trying to get more variation. More variation. You're recombining the traits and new combinations. Okay, I'm going to, um, what's the right word? Defer, there it is. Defer uh, exercise nine Mendelian genetics questions one through four to our lecture today. We'll be talking about all that in our lecture today. However, I would like for you to go down to number five because you are going to have to work a chi square on the test. So I want to remind you why. So if you would, page 119. It's number five. What's the purpose of chi-square? So why do scientists do this mathematical operation called chi-square? <laughs> to prove or show if their data support a hypothesis or they do not. This is to prove or show if their data support the hypothesis or they do not. Now you're going to have to be able to do that. We're going to do a chi-square on the test. Uh, you're actually given three lab stations to work on it. It's the same chi-square question, but you just work it for three lab stations. 
because students get stressed out like, what? Do a chi-square at one lab station. So what will happen is you'll get to the lab station for chi-square and you'll start working the problem. And then I'll say move to the next station. And when you get to the next station, guess what? It's the same question again. So you just keep working on it. And then, just in case you didn't have enough time, I go ahead and have you move again and you'll find the question for the third time. So you get three lab sessions. So all together it would be about five minutes total for you to work on that one problem. And don't worry, even if you don't finish then, what can you do at the end of the test? Go back. So on chi-square, what I need you to do is um, practice chi-square and go back and look at the ones that we did from last week. Let's look at the second part of, of um, number, I'm sorry, number six. It says, if you run the chi-square test and end up with a probability between 0.8 and 0.5, what does that mean? Did your data support your hypothesis? Yeah. Yes, it did. And then how about the second part of number six? A p-value greater than what is usually considered acceptable? Greater than what? Point one. Point one. As long as you're to the left of point one, your data supports a hypothesis. Now, you'd rather be as far to the left as possible, but anything to the left of point one is acceptable. Okay, so let me say it one more time. There will be a chi-square question on the test. There will be a chi-square question. All right, what should we bring when we come on Thursday? A calculator and a very good pencil. You've got to have a pencil. And I'll supply the scantrons. Is everybody okay with that? All right, now I want to tell you this. 